There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean, the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. It's time for another Friday Reads. Uh, back to regular programming, but uh, my mind and heart is not far away from the groundswell of justice sweeping the globe as a result uh, in light of all the horrific police brutality against black people and indigenous people. Canada has its own horrific police video released today. Didn't result in the indigenous chief's death, but uh, he was beaten very badly, and Canada is as racist as fuck. And the police brass, the top of the police in Canada, are saying, there's no such thing as systemic racism. I had three... I'm not going to talk about my personal experience with the police, but my work experience when I was a Kelly girl back in the day and just through various friends, I have had three opportunities to observe city police and the national police, the RCMP in Canada, in social settings or in work settings, and I have never seen such horrifically racist talk in all my life. Defund the police. Um, so I have two weeks of catching up to do, so I'm going to be pretty skimpy on what I tell you that happened the week before, because it's feeling a bit stale. I have three bails to tell you about, all of which happened the week previous. I bailed on a short story by that macho shithead sexual harassment asshole, Juno Diaz. It was part of the Faber series, The Cheater's Guide to Love. Doris and I were going to do our usual video discussion of it, and we both read the first 20 pages and puked and threw the book into the trash. It's about a misogynist jerk, written by a misogynist jerk. No, thank you. And I am well aware that the places where Juno Diaz works or whatever on the Pulitzer or whatever he's on, that they did their own investigation of the claims by some of our brightest, most talented young writers of the female persuasion who had accused him of gross sexual harassment, and they decided that they did not need to remove him from their employ or from their boards, and I say fuck that. I'm not going to say much about my bail of this, because I just think it might have been the wrong book at the wrong time. I read a chapter I wasn't wowed by the writing. It seemed gritty. I scanned the reviews, and... Even the people that loved this book, and there were many people, there are probably many of you watching who love this book, said it was almost too grim of a story, and I just thought, you know, not right now. I don't have a rant. I probably am going to give this another try later. I will tell you what I replaced it with for the Caribbean a little later in this broadcast, in this video. And I didn't get very far into that Welsh novel that I was so excited about when I started it. Eleanor Lewis's Dew on the Grass, originally published in 1934. It started out charmingly. It continued to be charming, but I, as I wrote in my Goodreads review, again, not a rant, <laughs> that I don't want to know too much about the book going in. And that works so well for me, 85, 90% of the time. But what happens is I often get into a book and realize that it's not a Sean book, and I probably would have found that out if I'd read the back cover. This book never got out of the perspective of the nine-year-old protagonist, and I, I can't. I just can't. No, 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 no. First chapter was great, and that was enough. Thank you very much. If you like child narrators, this one is really well done. It's at under 200 pages, I would recommend it very highly to you, but I started to feel suffocated by the limitation of that perspective on the world. I think I would have continued if they were, the adults were just absent from the story, like there were all these children, and they had parents and whatnot, but they just did not enter the story. That made it even more boring for me, so no. And I've replaced that with another Welsh novel. So those were my bales. No bales this week. I have finished a bunch. The first one I'll tell you about um, which was from the week before, wasn't to me a good book, although so many of you out there love this book. This was a buddy read with Hannah of Hannah's Books of Gloria Naylor's novel Mama Day, and I didn't hate it, and it started out really good. There was a lot of things about it that I liked, but it was not for me a successful novel. I gave it three stars. Uh, it was set on this fictional island on the border of one of the Carolinas and one of the other states down there. I, my geography is terrible, but it was a fictional island where there had been a slave revolt 
and then the descendants of those slaves created their own kind of unique culture, isolated from the rest of all the horrific racism going on on the mainland. And I liked the idea of that, but in practice it didn't... Well, two elderly ladies, Mama Day, who was 90, and her sister, I forget if she was younger or not, and their granddaughter was the main, were the main characters, and then there was, to me, there was just too many minor characters that I didn't care about, I didn't feel like I was made to care about them, and they took up a lot of space in the novel, and there was a lot of subplots that I thought really detracted, and the granddaughter meets and falls in love with an, and gets married to an African-American man in New York City, and their love story, while it had its moments, and I could really feel that Gloria Naylor was working hard to transcend and complicate their story beyond that of a romance novel, it didn't convincingly succeed. Mama Day was, she was a healer. Okay, there's some voodoo stuff, and I don't have as much problem with that kind of stuff, magic, when it's practiced by African Americans or just about anybody else but white people. When white people get into that stuff, it makes me want to vomit. Anyway, it didn't work for me. Didn't hate it. There were parts of it. The relationship between the two elderly sisters was a delight. There was a lot of conflict embedded into other relationships that I was kind of unconvinced by, particularly Mama Day and her grandniece, the, the young woman that lived in New York City. Didn't buy into that. Just didn't succeed for me. A lot of you out there loved it, and that's fabulous. A lot more of you who haven't read it probably would. So I'm not going to tell you not to, but... I won't comment on Hannah's. It was a reread for Hannah, and I, if she has commented on her channel about her impression the second time around, I have not had a chance to see that video. The rest of these I'm very enthusiastic about. I re started and finished, since you saw me last week, the Pulitzer Prize winning collection of poetry by the gay African-American poet Jericho Brown called The Tradition. And it was powerful. I really liked it. I, the, I would say about half of the poems I really loved and the others I liked. There were a few too many that I thought I needed to know more about his life to get the power of, or so they didn't kind of transcend. Do I need my poetry to transcend the personal to get into the political or the, or the ethereal level of meaning? I don't know, but there was quite a few of them that didn't kind of... I couldn't get the meaning of that I thought I needed to know him personally or know more about his biography to get, but a lot of them, especially the ones about living with HIV and uh, being a black man in America, were incredibly powerful. I think his most cited poem in that collection is called Bullet Points, and I featured an excerpt from that in my Sunday sentence last week. And I'm going to be doing another video that focuses on that poem. Stay tuned. I'm going to reread it. And maybe some of the ones that I didn't connect with as deeply, I will connect with. In which case, I'll be boosting that up to five stars. But I am really excited that Jericho Brown is in the world writing poetry. And just a few hours ago, finally, when did I start this? <laughs> I started this on March 5th. So March, April, May... Uh, it took me four months to read this, and it was a s deeply, deeply satisfying five-star slow read of Joseph Roth's novel, The Radetzky March. What a fantastic novel. I didn't know anything about his life until yesterday. I had a look at his Wikipedia page, because he died in 1939. Apparently, this wasn't published until 1951. That's what the inside says. As I told you way back in March when I started it, it starts with a... I think a Slovenian soldier who, and this part didn't happen, but uh, this soldier at the Battle of Solferino in 1859 stepped in front of the assassin and saved uh, Emperor Franz Joseph's life. That hey, this is Editing Sean. I totally screwed that up. No, it was not an assassin's bullet. Uh, Franz Joseph was leading the Austrian army in this battle, and he was pitted against the Franco-Sardinian alliance in the war for Italian independence, and uh, it was a soldier that was trying to kill Emperor Joseph because he was leading his army into battle. In fact, uh, these are true facts about the Battle of Solferino, which I've since found out. 1859, it was the last time that all... Um, that... that... All of the armies in a war were led by their monarchs, the last time in modern history. 
the Sardinian king was leading the Sardinian army, and the French king, Napoleon III, was leading his, and, and uh, Franz Joseph. It's the last time Fran Emperor Franz Joseph ever led his country into battle, and there were so many war crimes, so much uh, horrific uh, civilian violence against civilians and everything, that this battle led to the creation of the Red Cross, and, the G and indirectly, o over time, the Geneva Conventions. There's a little history lesson. Joseph Roth made that up and then... Just to be clear, what Joseph Roth made up out of thin air was that an Austrian soldier saved the emperor, the Austrian emperor's life by stepping in front of, an, of a soldier on the other side's bullet, okay? The young soldier was knighted, or whatever that would be called in Austria at the time, and became von Trotta. I just learned yesterday that's what the von sometimes meant. Didn't always mean that you were nobility, but he was knighted or ennobled is better, I think. Knighted doesn't go from one generation to the other, does it? Anyway, um, and it's the story of the three generations down to his grandson going up to around the middle of World War I. What an incredible study of fathers and sons and nationalism and the monarchy and revolution and sexuality. Women don't come off so well in this. I haven't found online that there have been much feminist critique. I think it lends itself to a feminist critique. The few women that show up are not very nice. I would have liked to have seen at least one that's kind of balanced things out. A study of masculinity and the... <laughs> how badly these men communicated with each other. It was so well done. I loved it. I just found out minutes after finishing it that he wrote a sequel, The Emperor's Tomb. It's short. The Radetzky March is about 350 pages. The Emperor's Tomb is about half that. So I will get to that one of these days. But magnificent read. Absolutely magnificent. I did this as part of the Read More Books, Read More German Books 2020 reading challenge. And I also finished The Beauty of the Death Cap by Catherine dostessier Coase, translated from the French by Tina Cover. And I really enjoyed this. It wasn't a Sean book, so I couldn't give it more than four stars, but very enthusiastic four stars. It was beautifully written slash translated. The story was very interesting. It's about, I'm not going to say too much about what it's about, because you need to kind of sink into it. It was reminiscent in some ways of Mur a Muriel Spark novel. So it got quite dark, but there was a lot of comedy in it too. And it's about this eccentric scholarly snob who is completely obsessed with mycology and mushrooms. He lives in France and he has a conflictual family life. He and his father were both into the mushrooms and there is so much mushroom. The plot is so intimately tied to various mushrooms, their discovery, their uses. And I googled pictures as I was going. I had such a good time with this book. And he, he was such an aesthet about food and cheese. And I was googling this. And I think I'm even going to make some recipes that the names of which appeared in the pages of this novella. And it gets very dark in kind of a comic way. Not a Sean book. I'm so glad I read it. Four stars. Those of you that like the kind of book I've just described, it would probably be a five-star read from you. I really recommend this. <laughs> so those are what I have finished. I have started a lot, too, some of which I can't talk to you about too much. The semi-final round of the BookTube prize is in full swing. It started on June 1st, so I am reading... I have started three. I can, I'm only going to tell you that I'm have started them. You won't hear anything about my reaction, my star rating, anything until early August. And they are Bernadine Evaristo's Girl, Woman, Other, Newfoundland Canadian novelist Michael Crummies, The Innocents, and Anne Patchett's Dutch House. More on those much later. When I finish them, I will tell you that I'm finished, but that's all you're going to hear me say. So it's any reference for the next six weeks are going to be really boring and brief. And then in August, let the chips fall where they may. So I decided not to go with the Nicole Dennis Ben novel. So I replaced it with a novel about the Caribbean British experience that I have been wanting to read for years. I remember just before I came to move to Japan, so 12, 13 years ago, 
One of my good friends, David, and my mom were talking about this novel, Small Island, by Andrea Levy, and they both loved it, and they were going on and on about it, and I said, how come I've never heard about this novel? It was completely new to me. It's been on my radar ever since. When I decided not to proceed with Nicole Dennis Ben, I thought, this is, come on, this is the time to do Small Island. The Caribbean only goes for about 10 days. I think it started on the 5th. Uh, I'll put the details in the show notes. I'm not much about following timelines. I like to sort of be kind of time adjacent to when a readathon gets me to focus on a particular kind of literature. So I have got a bare start on Small Island, and the writing is fantastic. The story opens in 1948. A Jamaican bride comes to London to start her life with her husband, who she barely knows, and it is really funny and more than funny in a way that's really working for me. The only other book I have started, and this is the one that I replaced for to have a Welsh novel on the go, is one that Charlotte of Tired Mama tries to read. Not only recommended to me, but she and I had a really in-depth discussion about it on our recent Zoom chat video. Best of Friends by Emer Humphreys. Emer Humphreys is a Anglo-Welsh writer and is still alive, aged 101. And he wrote, I think there was five books in this series. And this I've just kind of pieced together is number two in the series. This is Charlotte's favorite. I fell in love with it on page one, and I haven't got very far. I'm 30 pages into it, but every page, literally, I fall in love with it more. The two young girls are on their way from their hometown in Wales to a university. I think the university is on the other side of the border, or it's close to the border. I haven't quite... These border novels are a little confusing that way, but it doesn't matter so far. The characters of these women... These young women, Amy and Enid, and now their friend Mably, they're jumping off the page, making me laugh and squeal in delight. If it continues the way it's starting out, I am going to love this book. Originally published 1978, the whole series is apparently still in print in a much newer edition than this, and I will probably collect the whole series in that edition, but this is the one I got to give it a try. So that's what I've got on the go. My currently reading is now down to 13 down from 18 so I'm making progress. I'm gonna start one more this week to, now that I've finished my German language and translation novel. That uh, Joseph Roth novel was from Austria of course. I am going to pick up this small one because this will also fit for Pride Month reading At the Edge of the Night by Frido Lampe. One of the very few gay novels uh, written before the end of World War II in Germany, as far as I understand it. Banned by the Nazis, it says right on the cover. Translated from the German by Simon Beatty. And Frido Lampe was a disabled gay German writer who managed to survive the Nazi era. It's heartbreaking, really. Only to be shot by the Red Army six days before the end of the war. And this is his novel that was suppressed then. And it's only newly available in English. And it's short, so this is one of my pride reads. That's all I got for now. Hope everybody's doing well. Thanks for watching.